Hello and welcome to Taylor and Booty Organ Builders. My name is Chris Bono. Uh, I've been working here for 32 years and I'm going to give you a tour around the shop. Um, we're here on a weekend and so I don't have a mask on. We're, there is nobody in the shop except for uh, my cameraman who is far away from me. Except for my cameraman who is far away from me and wearing a mask. So this is our shop. It was built as a school in 1923. Uh, this, the school closed in 1956 and the building was abandoned for more than 20 years. Taylor and Booty's organ business started in Ohio in 1977 and moved here to this building in 1979. Uh, at that point they refurbished it and as you can see they've been here ever since. In 2005 we did add to the building a new pipe shop and a new machine room. So if you'd like, let's go inside and look around. Here's a map of the United States and uh, it has pins on it that uh, indicate all of the organs that we've built or are yet to build. The green ones are complete and the red pins are contracts. Um, we're pleased to see a lot of red pins these days. Over here also is a map of Japan. Uh, we have eight organs in Japan. Um, unfortunately, no new contracts, but maybe someday. So this is the casting room of the shop. This is where the pipes start out. Uh, we don't buy our pipes, but we make them, and we even make, essentially, the material that they're made out of, which starts out looking like this. So these are, we call them pigs because that's what the cast iron industry calls them. So in the back there are shiny yellow pigs of tin and in front of those are lead and different mixtures of tin and lead. <clears throat> so from this point they go over here into the casting pot. The melting pot. I don't know why I call it a casting pot. So this is propane fired and um, melts the material into molten metal. From here, the metal is transferred into this pot. Now I think you're going to see a video of this, but I'll describe it first. Um, once the metal is here, its temperature is measured when it's at the right temperature, and they try to get it within about five degrees, um, the metal is poured into the casting box, which you see here, which is made out of wood, which is kind of amazing since it's five or six hundred degrees. Uh, the casting box is then run down the table and the sheet is formed. This material is Nomex cloth, which is what's uh, uh, used for the the fire retardant suits of race car drivers and firefighters. So once the sheet is done, if it's good, uh, its thicknesses are measured around its perimeter and it's rolled up. One of the things that's important in um, the way we cast sheets is that the sheet is thicker on one end than on the other because uh, the pipe of course, a large pipe particularly, um, for strength, wants to be thin at the top and thick at the bottom. When you think about an organ pipe, it has a mouth, as you may know, at the bottom. So where its structure is most critical, a quarter of its diameter is removed. So as far as making a, an engineered structure, it's not very good. Uh, and so it has to be carefully compensated for in the way the pipe is made so that it won't collapse. For very large pipes, liners of copper uh, are often used, and in the foot also. And we'll talk about feet and bodies uh, in a little bit. So after the sheet is cast, it's rolled up. It's usually given an assignment right away, so the pipe makers will know that this is going to be eight foot C sharp of the pedal octave or uh, it's designated for mixtures and 
the, the metal is stored and cures for a little bit, and then it's hammered, which is uh, a procedure that not a lot of builders do. It's very ancient though, having been done certainly 500 years ago when organs were built. And it has a curious uh, effect on the metal. People think, oh well, maybe it makes it thinner, and in fact it doesn't. And sometimes people say, well, it makes it harder, and it doesn't make it harder either. Um, but one thing that it does is that it changes the structure of the molecules um, and packs them together, as you might imagine, before the metal is hammered. It's actually porous, and oil will soak through it after it's hammered. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't anymore. The other thing is that when metal is cast on a cloth surface like this, the inside of the pipe is rough. It, it mirrors the, the cloth, which isn't very good for uh, the way the pipe speaks. Um, when you consider that the instrument itself is in fact the air inside the pipe. So after the metal is hammered, the inside is smooth. And it actually has a significant effect on the, on the way the pipe works. So, we're going to talk about hammering here in just a second. We're outside again, getting ready to, uh, to watch some hammering occur, um, which is very noisy, and so we're, we're standing away for a little bit. Uh, Robbie Lawson is going to be doing the hammering. He's the head of the pipe shop, among other things. And um, again, the, the, this procedure is done for all, almost all of the pipes that we make. Um, except for pipes that have a very high tin content and our facade pipes. And in a, a little bit, uh, we're gonna show you how our drum lathe machines metal to thickness. But first, let's go in and get him started. So this is a pneumatically operated hammer and uh, you'll see what it does. This machine is designed for What? This machine is designed for metal working. So normally red hot iron would be hammered with it. Um, what we do is just torturous to the machine because basically there's a piece of paper inside the poor thing uh, instead of a piece of ductile um, uh, red hot iron. Um, also you might remember that in centuries past, this would have been done by hand, um, very slowly. So this is a nice, uh, a nice application of modern technology for a really, really old effect. I like it. Okay. Robbie is setting up the drum lathe, which we use to machine metal to thickness uh, for facade pipes in times past, here, it used to be done by hand, which was an extremely laborious task. Now the machine will, will uh, get the metal to the right thickness. Then the final finish is done with a hand scraper, the same that we would use for wood. Uh, it's, again, very laborious, even with the machine, uh, and only done for the facade pipes, and that's the easiest, the best way to make them look beautiful. Of course, it's very expensive. So here you go. You can see the cutter moving in and out. The reason it does that is to taper the thickness of the metal, as we talked about earlier, so that the pipe is thick at the bottom and thinner at the top. This sheet is about eight feet long and it would have a taper of about a third of a millimeter from one from the bottom to the top. And as you can see, the, the cutter moves in and out and it quickly recovers 
just as the cutter is going across the gap. It's a it's a wonderful mus machine. Um, we just stand back here and, and watch it most of the time. I, I I just I spend six or seven hours a day just looking at it. After the pipes are cast, hammered, or machined, or scraped, they come in here. This is the pipe shop uh, where they get made into pipes. Now down under this bench here, you'll see rolls of material which have been hammered, and they're ready for cutting out and soldering. These sheets are going to go into the next organ, as all the pipes for the current organ uh, have been made. There's hundreds of things in this room that are interesting, so I'm going to try and keep it, keep it to a minimum. Um, for instance, over here there are carvings and carving samples, um, which get designed here, made here. Robbie is one of the uh, main wood carvers. Um, there are some for continual organs, which you're seeing there. These are, it's a set that got replaced. and. Um, one of the many things that get done here. Now, over here, sort of to skip a few things, here's a set of shallots being made, which if you know how reed pipes made, are made, these are what the reed tongue vibrates up against, made out of brass. And this is just the very start of it. This will have a lead or a tin face soldered to it with an opening. Uh, more about reed pipes later. This is a 16-foot dulcian, by the way. There are no uh, metal flue pipes being made right now. Um, um, so I can't show you how that's done. They're rolled up and soldered, and I'll show you more about how those pipes work in a little bit. Here behind me, beside me, next to me, is an oboe from the 19th century. I think it's from the early 19th century that, uh, that we are are repairing and we're going to provide uh, replacement pipes for the ones that are missing. So sometimes we do that kind of work um, if, it's a, if it's a historically important organ. So if we come around this way, the metal pipes, once the sheets are cut out, are wrapped around steel forms, steel and wooden forms called mandrels. And there's a very large set of them all over this shop um, for different lengths, different diameters. As you can see, some are tapered and for use for uh, reed resonators or feet, the con conical feet of a, a flu pipe or a spitz flu. Taylor and Booty's normal organs are based on the North German Baroque and they're very elaborated and decorated and you saw the carvings that we do for them. The current project is aesthetically based on the 1966 Becquerot organ in Hildesheim, Germany. Uh, so a much different uh, art artistic vocabulary. So the carvings for this organ, the carvings, carvings, look like this. This is actually not quite finished. There are some other details to go. Um, but it's evoking that era of organ building. And uh, as you'll see in a little bit, the case of the organ is also clearly uh, influenced by, by Becquerot's work, and specifically that organ. Um, 1966 was after George Taylor had finished, finished his apprenticeship with Becquerot. He was there in the early 60s. So it's another nice connection with Taylor and Booty Organ Builders in that shop, and not only that shop, but that particular era. So we'll go and see the, the organ. This is the main woodworking shop, um, and this is an addition to the building which was completed in 2005, this room and also the pipe shop and casting room. Uh, it's a very complete woodworking shop with table saws, routers, joiners, thickness planers. Uh, we have a five by 10 foot 
CNC router, which we use to make all kinds of things, like wind chests, for instance. And right here next to me is part of the case of the organ that we're building right now. Um, this is the impost, the bottom part of the rook positive. Uh, you'll see the support frame uh, for that short, shortly. Um, and this part here is actually the cornice, which is going to be about six feet higher than it is. Even though this instrument is in a modern style, without moldings and without decoration really, it's phenomenally difficult to build because all of the surfaces, virtually all of the surfaces are angled and so computing saw angles and there's compound joints and, and lots of uh, very finicky woodworking in this, it's been uh, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, frequently the, uh, the Baroque style organs are simply straight with moldings and, and are actually more straightforward to build. Um, but these are uh, a, a challenge that's, that's worth it. It's, uh, it's going to be quite a stunning instrument. And we'll go and look at the rest of it now. This is the area where the wind chests are made generally. Um, right now they're all done, so what's left is uh, uh, the drawings. We can go and see the wind chests later, but over here on the wall you can see full-size uh, printouts of the design. Uh, this is the root positive. And now Non-organists, non-organ builders often look at this and cannot believe how many pipes there are in the organ. Um, I actually had somebody tell me one time, I said, I think that our church organ has 150 pipes. We know better. This is, like I say, rook positive, it's half of it, this is the center of it, so we only print one half because it's symmetrical. And over here is the grate. Um, Again, half of the grate, so enormous uh, wind chests. Um, here's the mixture, just lots and lots and lots of little pipes, reeds, 16 and 8 foot, etc. There's a, a lot of really amazing things here. Uh, also in this room right now, the tractor action is being constructed. And since our organ in Bon Air about uh, 10 years ago, we make our trackers out of car carbon fiber. And uh, this material is um, a flat carbon fiber. The first few that we did were actually round, but they made noise. So this is a much quieter material, and it comes on a long roll. One of the main uh, impetuses that made us change from wood to carbon fiber is uh, our organ at Grace Church which has four manuals and about 5,000 pipes. And in that church, there are tracker runs of 50 feet. Now, wooden trackers would work just fine at that length, but the total tracker length in the organ is about two miles. And the concept of making two miles of wooden trackers uh, didn't seem very efficient. And so we, we switched then to carbon fiber. Um, and we still do it today. Uh, it's, it is uh, very efficient and it's an excellent material, it's so light. In fact, uh, we say it's weightless because when we get a spool of this material, which is a big wooden spool, and weigh it, then we will take the trackers off of it, we'll use up the material, the spool still weighs the same, as if the trackers weighed nothing. Uh, and it comes generally with uh, 5,000 feet on a spool. So, um, we'll go and look now at the uh, tracker action inside the orb. Mm. All right. Rolling. Here we are in the main setup shop, finally. Um, and behind me is the Wheaton organ. As you can see, the case has been built and we're starting to install racks and action um, and you can see clearly the, the aesthetic design of the instrument, very plain and with angled fronts as the Becherat organs 
frequently were. The case of the organ is made out of white oak with a uh, transparent finish on it, and you can see also that uh, the motto of the college has been engraved above the keyboards uh, and filled with gold leaf. So as you can see, this is a three manual organ and the layout of the instrument is completely uh, common with the Verk Princip you may know about, uh, the different divisions in different spots. So as you have seen, the pedal towers on the two sides, which have the largest pipes in the organ, in fact, 16-foot principal low D uh, is in the facade. Um, above the manual keyboards will be the Brustwerk, all the pipes with the top keyboard. Right here in front of me are the wind chests for the rook positive, and we looked at the rook positive case being built in the machine room. I've taken the cover off of one wind chest so that you can see um, the core of the, of the chest, which the sliders will rest on in here, um, and the, it has two sides, as you can see. Um, the, the grate, the main part of the organ, is over here, and it is being constructed here on the floor of the shop so that we can easily rack the pipes and, and do all of the work that needs to be done. Um, up in the air, it would be up in the air when it's complete. So the great case that you see here goes on top of the Brustwerk. And um, it's not there now, and no, it won't be because it won't fit in our shop. Here is the drawing of the organ. And so as you can see behind me, what we just looked at is the great division. Um, Pedal towers, root positive, and behind these doors is the Brustwerk. The organ actually was contracted for as a two manual instrument, and we hadn't gotten very far into the design, and they said, let's make it three, which was a nice thing to hear. It's going to be a very complete organ. Um, so let's step up here and look at the keyboards. So even though this is a modern instrument, you can see modern style, um, we still make our keys the same way uh, as we would for any other organ. Uh, they are, I usually make people guess when they come for a tour. I hold, I let them touch the keys and I say, what are they made out of? And people will guess the most fantastic things. They'll say, unicorn horns or moon rocks or things that just could never be made into a key. And then finally I will tell them this is in fact cowbone. And they'll just be amazed. Cowbone? Oh my goodness! I thought it was uranium. It's cowbone. And the black keys are ebony. Um, and as you can see uh, if you get up close, I don't know if you can get up close, the keys have three lines on them as they would in a, in a Baroque organ. And we have, the, the front molding is made out of ebony also. As the organ is being constructed, the first parts of the action have been installed, which you see right in front of you. This is the action for the upper manual, the Brustwerk. Um, and here we have black metal rollers and the carbon fiber trackers. And the rollers are an essential part of the action. It does two, they do two things. One is that they spread the action out because the wind chests are certainly much wider than the keyboard, but they also change the order of the pipes. They're not chromatic as the keys are. So, and this is an, an ancient method of doing this, uh, using modern materials. And in fact, this division even plays. Um, let's see. As you can see, the stop knobs have not been, not been um, constructed yet, and the stop action has just been started. Now, 
the last several organs that we've built use electric stop action, which is done for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the main ones is so that the organ can have a combination action. It also can allow for some uh, ease of construction and, and design layout. This organ is, uh, even though it is a very modern aesthetic, it is as mechanically uh, old as, as we do. So all of the stop knobs are mechanical. Of course, all of the playing action is mechanical. And as we'll see in a minute, this organ can be foot pumped. So it's possible to play it with no electricity at all, except maybe the, the music light. This is the side of one of the pedal towers. Um, and what you can see here is part of the reed pipes. This organ has a 16-foot posauna in the pedal, 8-foot trumpet, and a 2-foot cornet. And unlike most modern builders who use metal reed boots, uh, we use wooden ones as they would have done hundreds of years ago. Um, we find there are a lot of advantages to doing it that way. So the reed boots are here and the pipes have been assembled. They have not been installed yet and you can see the elaborate racks which are used to hold the pipes up. The back of the organ um, which of course will be up against the wall in, the, in its final destination, which is a, a concert hall. We are so used to calling the destination of the organ a church, we have a hard time not saying when the organ gets to the church, not in this case. So you can see here the wooden wind lines. Um, we use square wooden wind lines uh, throughout the organ. Um, it's traditional and certainly is, uh, affects the way the, the subtleties of the wind works. Here are the three bellows for the organ, uh, which are, will have an electric blower. This is a temporary electric blower, but um, the, they will be fed electrically so you can play the organ without hiring somebody to pump it. But this organ is also foot pumpable as I mentioned before. So there are three pedals and there'll be a box to stand on, but I can... And right now the wind system has, has an intentional leak so that they're not staying closed as long as they should, staying open as long as they should. Oh, and there it's going to make a noise for us. So these bellows will be uh, in a slightly different orientation to the organ when we get to the concert hall, uh, more or less turned around. But the person, ah, the person pumping the organ will be in the room with it um, so that it's possible to hear. We really don't like to put foot pump mechanisms in a place where the where the organ pumper is uh, doesn't feel like part of the music. And in this case, um, or in some cases, we'll put a music rack here so that the organ pumper can, in fact, watch the music at the same time. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, thing to do because even though you're not pushing the keys down, when you're pumping the organ, you really feel like a part of the music. And of course, you always have in the back of your mind that if you stop, the organist will stop. So here is the CAD program that we use to design the organs. Uh, ancient instrument and modern design method. There are a lot of challenges uh, that face mechanical action organ builders that, that don't really occur when building and designing electric action organs. Um, the fact that the organ has to be all in one spot is uh, one, uh, one challenge. Of course, it's also one benefit. And the, uh, 
the layout of the Winchests and the divisions is also more proscribed, but again, it makes for a, a really, really integrated musical instrument. And of course, we are committed to mechanical key action, which, when it's carefully designed and carefully made and regulated, provides the, the, the best connection between the organist and the organ. Um, and that's certainly one of the reasons that people keep buying them. Um, we've, we've designed organs in many uh, different spaces. Uh, the simplest ones are simply standing on the floor, complete, and the wind system may be behind the organ, and the entire instrument can be constructed here, taken apart, and then reinstalled. But we've also done organs like our largest organ in Grace Church, New York, where the organ is in three different locations with tracker action under the floor. Um, some tracker runs as, as much as almost 50 feet, and the detached console and an instrument that had to be uh, built here in pieces and not completed until it was installed in the church. The organ, in fact, is 60 feet wide from the back of one case to the back of the most distant case. And uh, it, was a, it was a challenge, but it was a challenge that was worth it, and the, the organ turned out well. Um, so, lots of challenges. There are tonal challenges also when, in designing instruments that are supposed to do different jobs. Uh, for the most part, we certainly use the, the North German Baroque as a starting point, but we are also very comfortable building swell boxes and strings and we've done high pressure work and we've done 32 foot stops. Um, so starting with the basis of mechanical action, if, if possible mechanical stop action, um, we are able to build many different styles of organs suitable for, well certainly uh, Bach, but uh, Vierne and Vidor and modern music, howls, and also to the, to the demands of, of accompanying uh, choral music, modern choral music, and, and, and the modern church service. And we work with organists all the time in, in developing uh, and, and uh, tweaking the tonal design that we do. Also, I am an organist in two churches, so uh, I have some input myself. So let's talk a little bit about voicing, and I'm not sure how familiar uh, you are about the way the pipes work, but um, the basics are that a nor normal pipe, this is the principal pipe, uh, the air goes in the bottom, the wind, and it comes through this tiny slit here, which uh, is called the flue, and hence this is a flue pipe. The the wind sheet that comes out of there passes just outside the upper lip. Also, the parts of the pipe, um, uh, we always say, reflect on the, the idea that we think of them as people. So this pipe, for instance, as a, as a typical example, has a foot and a toe and a body. It also has a mouth and an upper lip and a lower lip. And these pipes over here have ears. And this one has a cap. So sometimes also there is a, a piece that goes between the ears and that's a beard. So just like people. So an ordinary flu pipe like this one, this is as I say a principle, um, when they come from the pipe shop usually uh, they make a sound, but it's sort of like a cat screeching or a young violinist or something. They're not, they're not, they're not um, made to speak automatically. It's, 
That's the voicer's job. So the first thing that we do as we get the pipes is we have to make this mouth the right dimension. So we have a chart and we transfer that dimension onto the pipe and then using a, a sharp knife called a cutout knife, we, we open this up. Then we have to look carefully at the uh, alignment of all the different parts of the pipe. The, um, oh, I skipped a piece. There's one more part and it is between the foot and the body and it's, it's a sort of a shelf that, that completely goes between the, the um, foot and the body except for the flue and it's the only part of the pipe that we use a Latin term for and it is the languid which uh, I usually make people try and translate it. Um, languid, lingua, tongue although in this case this tongue does not move. So, but the languid is the most important part of the pipe um, in terms of uh, of its voicing. So, we open this uh, the mouth up and we make sure everything is aligned carefully. We make sure that the language is straight. We make sure that the flue is straight across and that it is it's even in uh, dimension. And then what most usually happens is that the language starts off too high and that's the result. So the pipe uh, is sort of trying to play and the windsheet is coming out quite far from the upper lip. So if it starts off there we have an easy job and we have to just lay, lower the language to get it to speak. So I'm going to use a key weight. This is a languid depressor also called a cow's foot. For big pipes, we use a bigger cow. So, it doesn't take much. Now, that's playing, but it's slow. It's literally slow, and that's what we, what we, how we describe that sound. The pipe comes on slowly. Um, if you even a little faster and now what we do to test this is we we blow in it see it went to the octave too easily so this pipe actually is too fast which means the language is too low the windsheet is in too far the only reason it's called fast is it's because it's the opposite of slow sounds good and then we can test its speed. Still too fast. I'm going to raise the language just a little bit more. Even on a pipe this size most of the adjustments are invisible or barely visible. Still too fast. It, over, it, it overblew at one point. Try it again. Just doesn't want to come back down. being recalcitrant, but pretty good. That's a reasonable starting point. Now, if I was voicing a stop, I'd get the next pipe and, and go on. Now, we do all of the same um, procedures in a row. We would, we would cut up all the pipes at the same time and we adjust things and then we go put them on the voicing machine until we have the whole stop here. And when they're all playing, reasonably well. Uh, we measure them with an electronic tuning machine and cut them off. Uh, we do not use slide tuners. Uh, for large pipes we put a tuning scroll um, uh, for tuning and for the smaller ones they're tuned with tuning cones which I'll talk about in a little, little bit. Other forms of metal pipes we have here. So this is an open pipe, an ordinary principle. This one with its hat on there is a gedact, which is
is about an octave lower, well in this case it's, a, it's about the same pitch, it plays about twice as long as it, as it is. I didn't get two pipes that are the same pitch. Obviously uh, wildly different um, tone as well as different pitch. Um, here's a, the next step is to put a, uh, a tube in the cap. The German word for tube is Rohr. So this is a Rohr flute. Very, very different sound. And also, here's a Spitz flute, which is like a principal pipe, except that it's tapered. They're all very different pitches. I wonder what it But very, very different sounds. Um, we also make uh, flute pipes out of wood, and they can be made in different diameters also to produce different effects. So the other type of pipe, these are flute pipes, as you probably know, are reed pipes. Um, and I have here a sample of an ordinary Taylor Booty trumpet, which, uh, as you saw earlier in the pedal, um, the boots and blocks are made out of wood, which is as, as they would have done in the old days. Other than that, um, very similar to a modern um, metal reed. Uh, so in here is the, the shallot, which is this tube, and then the tongue, which is brass and vibrates up against the shallot, and then the tuning wire, which you can use to change the vibrating length of the reed, which is what tunes it. And the shallot is in communication with the resonator. Uh, the, the way we build these, the resonator and the reed pitch are in, in agreement so that they're very stable. And let's see if we play this what it sounds like. It's a sample pipe, it's a little slow. And here's how we make it match the resonator. Flip it over. Much better. That's a trumpet, ordinary trumpet for us. Here's a, um, a dulcian. Uh, we generally don't make clarinets, but this is as close as we come. And this, I think, is already set up right. This is quite powerful, um, more of a chromorn, uh, like the, the French chromorn, but um, two very different styles of reed. Of course, you can change resonator dimensions and diameters and, and uh, vary the fact quite a bit. As a comparison between uh, large and small reed, reed pipes, uh, here is the high G. Of, of an eight-foot trumpet where the tongue is absolutely tiny in the shallot and it's very difficult to to voice and to tune and to manipulate and on the other end of the scale literally this is it's a sample pipe we made this is 32 foot C of the contraophoclide in our organ at Grace Church in New York. So the tongue for this giant pipe, as you can see, is significantly bigger than this, this entire high G. Um, and this resonator in the, in the organ at Grace Church is 32 feet long, made of wood. So those are the extremes, which we don't do very often. So uh, the way we tune the organs is not by using a, a tuning sleeve. You can see tuning sleeves in these pipes which can be slid up and down by a, a tool for tuning, but we cut the pipes to dead length and then any tuning is done with tuning cones uh, for fine tuning. And so, for instance, it's very subtle but that made that pipe flatter, and if I go too far, I can go this way. 
not that you can. So this is an ancient method of tuning and uh, it's very stable. Uh, it takes more time, but we think that the, the pipes like it better as far as the way they speak and it's, it's, it, the tunings tend to stay good for longer. Uh, and the last thing I have here is uh, this guy. According to my machine, this plays at about 14,500 hertz and it's a test for hearing and uh, audio record and playback alike. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can hear it, but I can sure hear it screaming. Very top note, not usually found in an organ. Well, that's our tour. Thank you for coming. I left a lot of things out, but we didn't have all that much time. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, keep your eye on the Taylor and Booty website for updates on the construction and installation of this organ. And uh, we hope to see you sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Bye.